Good morning, church. I'm super excited to be with you again this morning. Today we are going to continue our sermon series on the Gospel of John. So get your Bibles open, turn to John chapter 15, and uh, we're going to pick up there in just a moment. And uh, while you're turning there, I wanted to share some good news. I'm very excited about the campus retreat that happened just last weekend. And with the craziness of the year that's been going on, it was extremely refreshing to get out into the mountains, uh, get into Estes, and have a retreat. Um, it seems like we got our retreat in just in time because if we would have decided to have the retreat this weekend instead of the previous weekend, uh, we would have gotten flushed out of Estes by the fires and it would have interrupted the retreat. But all went well. The theme of the retreat was actually Red Letter Revolution. Obviously, most of you know that uh, Jesus' words in a lot of different Bibles are in red ink and so um, the students from our campus ministry as well as students from our sister campus ministry in Grand Junction came together and heard lessons about Jesus's words it was extremely impactful and just extremely refreshing to have the opportunity to actually be together in that way we obviously uh, abided within uh, COVID restrictions and whatnot but it felt like one of the most normal things that we've done in quite some time so the college ministry came back refreshed and excited uh, to continue to uh, continue the mission here in Fort Collins, and it was just an incredibly encouraging time to be with our brothers and sisters from Grand Junction. So, just wanted to share a little good news from that. As we kind of jump into the lesson today, um, I, I want to kind of look back in the Gospel of John, in a sense, because up until this point, uh, Jesus has demonstrated his divine power by performing miracles living a perfect life, and teaching his disciples what it really means to follow God. And I think now's a good time to, like I said, look back at what's just transpired within the last even five, six chapters of the book of John, just to kind of root ourselves firmly in the gospel story, because we've been in John all year, and sometimes I think we need to take a recap. So a few things that have happened. In chapter 10, uh, Jesus says that he is a good, shep good shepherd, and he is the one through whom eternal life comes. In chapter 11, Jesus raises his friend Lazarus from the dead. In chapter 12, he enters Jerusalem to the shouts of Hosanna. Right? If you remember that, Jesus enters Jerusalem as king like the prophecy suggested he would do. And as king, just one chapter later... Jesus gets on his hands and knees and washes his disciples' feet. And he didn't just wash his disciples' feet. We have to remember that Judas himself was present, the one who was to betray him. In chapter 14, he proclaims that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to God unless they go through him. And in chapter 15, he teaches his disciples that... He teaches his disciples that we must abide in him and we must bear good fruit and glorify God. And in order to just survive spiritually, we must abide in him, the true vine. All of these things brought a lot of tension. And wherever you are, I want you to imagine what the tension in Jerusalem must have felt like for Jesus and his disciples during the time of his earthly ministry. You see, Jesus came in to usher a new covenant. And I want to put some emphasis on the word new. As people, we don't tend to actually like changes. For example, how many of you feel, or how would you feel if, uh, if you showed up to work one day and you found out that your boss had been fired and that you now have a new boss? Actually, it depends on your boss, so I guess that's a bad example. But... It's like if you move in with new roommates or maybe you're newly married, like they put the toilet paper in the wrong, uh, facing the wrong direction or um, they leave their dishes in the sink. And I guess for me it's kind of a double-edged sword because Nadia actually knows where all my stuff is, but she also moves all of it. So if she's not home, I'm actually in trouble. My point in all of this is that change can be difficult. Those might not have been the best examples, but change can be difficult. We're creatures of habit, and we like to know how things are going to operate. And Jesus brought in this new covenant. 
He brought in new teachings that challenged the condition of the heart rather than just the behavior. He taught that he was equal to God and declared that salvation comes only through him. You see, his claims were accompanied by shockwaves that would eventually make it to the ends of the earth. And his claims, if true, promised to turn life as people knew it upside down, and it did. And at this stage in the story, a plot to kill Jesus and ruin his reputation was already set into motion. And here in John 15, he is preparing his disciples for the storm that is coming. Big changes were on the horizon. And so the title of today's lesson is Chosen for Change. Now a couple weeks ago, we had an amazing teen service. I was very impacted by all the ways that the teen served during that service and Specifically, Ethan and Riley did an outstanding job teaching from John 15 on remaining in Jesus. And picking up where they left off in verse 16 of John chapter 15, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. This week, we will cover one of the primary purposes that Jesus has been training his disciples for and what the implications are for those who choose to abide in this calling, to abide in this purpose. What purpose is that, do you ask? Well, I'm super grateful that you ask because it's kind of lonely preaching to a camera all the time. The purpose is that we bear fruit that will last. So not only will we learn about this purpose, But these scriptures will also allow us to test our lives and see how closely we have been abiding uh, abiding in Christ. Amen? Let's dive in. We're going to read kind of somewhat of a big chunk of scripture here. So in John chapter 15, we'll pick up in verse 16, the verse we just read. It says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. Skipping down to chapter 16, starting in verse 1, it says, All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, You will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. Amen. So let's begin by considering a portion of verse 19. It says, As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Now in Christianity, this is actually a pretty common phrase. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen stickers on the back of people's cars that says N-O-T-W, stands for not of this world. It's a Christian clothing brand of sorts. But what does it actually mean to not belong to the world? Or what does it mean to belong to the world? To love the world or to not love the world? What does it actually mean to be worldly? Well, here are a couple of scriptures that can guide us. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 uh, 15 through 17 say this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of possessions, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. In James chapter 4, verse 4, it says, You adulterous people, 
Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And in Titus chapter 2, our, our, our famous verse, one we read often in church, verses 11 through 12 says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. You see, Scripture teaches us this world is temporary, and so are its desires. But if you're like me, it's not an intuitive thing when you hear the, the term worldly, unless I, I know what it, that means, what it, its definition is. You see, worldly desires are characterized as sin. And in the Titus passage, we are taught that to be worldly is to be ungodly. God's purpose for us is to bear fruit that will last. And the way we do that, according to Jesus, is by loving radically. Living an ungodly, worldly life is by its very nature opposed to the radical love that Jesus calls us to. Which is why James says that if you're a friend of the world, you are an enemy of God. And what perhaps hit me harder is if I make that, that, that phrase and I flip it around, it basically reads like this, if you are a friend of God, you are an enemy to the world. And that's exactly what Jesus' disciples became. Jesus knew that what they were uh, Jesus knew what they were headed for and he warned them that the world is going to hate you just remember that it hated me first. And later on in in, uh, in chapter 16 it says they're going to kill you and they're going to think that by killing you it's, it's it's a service to God. Taking up their cross was not just this meta uh, metaphorical version of self-denial. It meant that by following Jesus, they were signing their death warrant. I want to take a moment to recap the fate of just Jesus' 13 apostles. There were his 12, and then Judas did what Judas did. He betrayed Jesus, and he was replaced with Matthias. And then the 13th apostle is actually Paul. So we're going to cover just the fate of what happened. And now just before I get started, there's some uh, debate as to exactly how or where each of the apostles was martyred. But the overwhelming narrative throughout history is that the apostles were martyrs. The cause of death that I'm going to list here is just the one that through my research uh, was found to be the most universally accepted. And, and just by the way, some of these were actually pretty confirmable um, no disputes at all, but there's a handful that are. Peter, for example, was cru uh, crucified upside down in Rome. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross in, uh, in the Greek city of Patras. James was slain by the sword in Rome. Thomas was speared in India. Philip was crucified. Bartholomew was flayed and then beheaded. Matthew was burned at the stake in Ethiopia. James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified in Egypt. Jude was murdered with an axe in Syria, along with Simon the Zealot, who was sawn in two. Matthias was stoned in Georgia. Not, not Georgia like Atlanta, Georgia. Different Georgia. Uh, Paul was beheaded in Rome. I just want you guys to let that sink in for a second. Think about what the apostles went through to preach the gospel. And I didn't mention John because according to historical accounts, John is accepted to be pretty much the only apostle who wasn't martyred. And it wasn't for lack of trying. John was actually boiled in oil before being exiled to the island of Patmos. And clearly Jesus decided that it wasn't his time to go because he still had to pen the book of Revelation. So, so why am I telling you this? Why am I recapping what the apostles were headed for? What they actually endured? Well, to not only show that Jesus pro uh, prophetically predicted what would happen, but it's also important to remember that the road the gospel traveled upon to get to us is actually covered in blood. 
The trail of martyrs doesn't just end at the apostles. It's estimated, according to the Esther Project, and the Esther Project is an organization that tracks church persecution, is that there have been over 70 million Christian martyrs throughout history. Sometimes I stop and I ask myself, is the gospel that I received any different than the gospel that they received? Now, if the answer is no, then I'm called to the same standard. And if the answer is yes, which I believe it is, then I am called to the same standard. And so then I have a, another question that immediately pops up into my mind. Why am I not persecuted? And when I think of persecution, I'm, I'm talking about what they went through. And much of what I teach on this morning, by the way, church, is going to be speaking to people who do not face persecution. Because in my experience in Fort Collins, Colorado, and in Albuquerque before I moved here, is that I, I don't really face persecution. Have I faced little things here and there? Absolutely. But when I read what Jesus told his apostles to expect, his disciples to expect, I've never experienced anything like that. And so much of what I teach on for this point is going to be for those who've never been persecuted. If you have been persecuted, amen, brother, sister, tell us about your stories. Um, I want to hear about them, but this is... Mostly for those who haven't been, and that's most of the people watching in this morning. See, what's fascinating is that Jesus' disciples longed to be persecuted and longed to suffer like Christ did. Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection of the dead. Paul writes that to the church in Philippi. But previously to that, in the book of Acts, starting in verse 40, you have Peter, James, and John. And, and uh, in verse, starting in verse 40, the second half of it, it says, They called the apostles in and had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm sure many of you by this point have seen the passion of the Christ. And if you haven't, I recommend it's actually something worth doing. But in it, you actually get to see a dramatized version of what it looks like to be flogged. And it's brutal. I've not yet met a person who can watch that account and not wince from watching just the dramatized version of what Jesus went through when he was flogged. It says that the disciples were flogged and they left rejoicing. Think about that. They left rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. So another question entered my mind when, when studying this out. If the apostles lived as we do today, would they have been martyred? As I ask myself that question, I want you to ask yourself that very same question. If they lived the way that I live, would they have been martyred the same way? If they lived the way you're currently living, would they have been martyred the same way? You see, there are two characteristics that marked our early church fathers that led to the persecution that they received. And those two characteristics go like this. They lived holy and they lived boldly. As disciples of Jesus, we are also called to live holy lives. Those who are of the world will inevitably be offended at this holiness. And just a quick definition, we'll, we'll dive into the first one, um, to live holy. It means to be set apart, to be pure, to be righteous. And we'll take a, a quick look at a couple of these scriptures here. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles... To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans 
that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. These sinful and worldly passions, church, wage war against our souls. And just considering that language, considering what that means, I want us to take an inward look at the convictions that we currently have. The world around us, especially where we live, is saturated with greed, with sex, with jealousy, deceit, violence, with perverseness, evil speech, slander. These characteristics can make their way into our hearts and therefore our lives by these different avenues. I want us to consider what is our workplace like? What are the conversations within our workplace? Do we tolerate or participate in gossip? Here's a huge one. What about movies and the TV that we consume? Are we okay with the occasional sex scene or inappropriate uh, joke? Or do we research the content in it before we advance? Or before we continue and decide to watch the movie? How about the music that we listen to? This one's actually big for me. I grew up loving uh, rap. And as most of you know, the majority of rap that's out there is saturated in ungodliness talking about violence and drugs and sex. I let all of that go when I became a Christian. And so now when you hear me most of the time quote lyrics from the stage, it's from Christian rap because I had to replace the ungodly with the godly. Do you tolerate any ungodly music in your life? How about social media? Do you take seriously what you'll consume and for how long you'll consume it? Basically, you're allowing algorithms to determine what you'll consume. Do you have strong convictions on alcohol? Or do you come up with other ways to justify drunkenness? Another thing, the world tells us about style and what we wear and how we dress. Do we want to look good in the eyes of the world? Or do we want to appear modest before the God who gave his life for us? These are just a few of the examples that I have to examine the convictions that we have that are kind of displayed outwardly, right? So I want to encourage you, if, if I hit any of those um, that, that you recognize are probably a little weak there, uh, I want to encourage you to spend some serious time thinking about um, what's going on in that particular area. Maybe it's something different that I didn't even mention. And here's the thing, I'm bringing these up I'm not bringing these up primarily to say that if you're slacking in this area, to simply just stop doing what you're doing. Fix yourself, right? If you've heard me preach enough, if you've heard Mike preach enough, we know we can't fix ourselves. But I am bringing these things up in hopes that we can drag them into the light because examining ourselves as it pertains to holiness can tell us a lot about our relationship with God. In John 15, what Ethan and, and, uh, and uh, Riley preached about, Jesus says that apart from me, we can do nothing, right? If we abide in Christ, we'll bear good fruit. What fruit are you bearing? Is it good? If some of those convictions that I mentioned earlier are running wild, if you've slacked off or if you've softened on some of these convictions, it's likely an indicator of how closely you're abiding in Christ, Our battle against these ungodly things, these worldly tendencies, will rage on until it's time to go home to heaven. But if you are honest with yourself and you've relaxed these convictions, or you don't have a conviction in a particular area you should, I want us to be sober-minded and let that sober-mindedness propel us into being closer to Jesus, doing whatever it takes to get closer to Him. Holiness needs to be taken seriously. And I think we're too afraid to speak up for what is right or to live in a righteous way for fear of not being accepted by the world. But we're told in Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, let us 
uh, let us offer our bodies as living sacrifices and to not conform to the pattern of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. It's so easy to be conformed to the pattern of this world. We must live holy lives. And then second, the disciples didn't just live holy lives. They lived boldly. And here in this point in lies likely what got the apostles killed and martyred. If we go back to John 15, we kind of see why. It says in verse 26, at the end of the chapter, it says, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. But here's the part that I'm talking about, verse 27. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. So what got them killed? They decided to testify about Jesus the way he commanded and by living the way Jesus did, by remaining close to him, they underwent a radical transformation in their lives. They shared everything was uh, they shared everything they owned and didn't claim that anything was only theirs. They healed the sick and they provided for the poor. They testified to the fact that only by the power of Jesus, the Messiah, were all these things possible. And they not only gave Christ the glory for all that had been going on, but they also said that unless they repent and were baptized in the name of Jesus, they couldn't be saved. No one can be saved. In fact, Peter, James, and John, right early on in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, they actually, actually I believe it's in chapter 3, they actually heal this lame beggar, this guy who can't walk, right? And... Stating that this, uh, this beggar was healed, uh, Peter, Peter, James, and John, they're dragged before the Sanhedrin. And after stating that this beggar is only healed by the power of Jesus Christ, which made them mad enough as it was, in verse 12, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. You see, People these days say, I don't, I don't really believe I need to actively share my faith. I'll just be a really good example. I'll just be a good person. You see, I, I, agree you should, I agree that you should be a good example because the Bible absolutely says that people will know that we are his disciples by our love, right? And you know what I say to that? Yes, amen. Hallelujah. People will know that we are his disciples by our love. I would agree with that. But I would argue that the most loving thing that we can ever do, ever, is to let someone know that the only way that they can know God is through Jesus Christ. You see, church, we live in a country where to be explicitly and unapologetically Christian is frowned upon. We live in a country where it's more common for good vibes and good thoughts to be asked for than for prayer to be asked for. The president of a, of a university uh, I read uh, it, referring to the, the fires that we're experiencing is that please send, you know, there was a tweet sent out that, that basically read, please send good thoughts to the firefighters, right? Man, I, my good thoughts, my good vibes, they have no power. What are my good thoughts going to accomplish for people? My thoughts can't help you, but my God can help you. In an increasingly politically correct landscape, we must unapologetically testify to the power of Jesus Christ for salvation. That's offensive to those who belong to the world. But it's also their only hope. So yes, we should be kind. Yes, we should be loving. Yes, we should live holy lives and be excellent examples for people in the world. But being a good, loving example isn't what got the apostles brutally martyred. It was the unapologetic proclamation of the gospel that Jesus Christ is the power unto salvation and there's no other name by which we must be saved. That's why they got killed. 
And my plea to myself and to, to you listening is that we that if we abide in Christ the way Jesus uh, calls us to in John 15, that if we rely on him the way the apostles did, we might experience the blessing of persecution. I don't think of... I don't think of persecution as blessing, if I'm being completely honest. But the apostles did. But Jesus taught that. In Sermon on the Mount, devoted three Beatitudes to persecution. Paul longed to suffer with Jesus, for Jesus. And, and guess what, church? In the country that we live in, if we unapologetically proclaim Christ... It may not end in our martyrdom. In fact, I, I can almost guarantee it won't end in your martyrdom. But it is a confirmation that we are not of this world. And that we have been chosen by the power of God to change the world. You are chosen to change the world by God. You have a purpose. If you follow Jesus, your purpose is to take a stand for the way that we were designed and created. And that's to love our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the only way that that's possible is by the power of Jesus Christ. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I want to share one last scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, it says, For the Spirit of God, for the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to what? To a holy life. Because of anything, not because of anything we've done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Church, Jesus, through his death, burial, and resurrection, has destroyed death. And because of that, he has saved us and called us to a holy life. And living that holy life will inevitably lead to suffering for the gospel. And because God decided to allow us to be born in America, our suffering will look different. I can go outside right now on the street corner and proclaim Jesus Christ is Lord, and I'm not going to get killed. There might be somebody out there that's crazy enough to do it, but he'd go to jail. But we must take this call seriously. Remember, we do not belong to the world. We have been purchased by the blood of Jesus. We're not of this world. We're foreigners and exiles just passing through on our way to heaven. Let's pray for communion. Father, we come before you right now uh, incredibly humbled and grateful. Your word is serious. Jesus, you prepared your disciples to face certain death for the glory of your name and for the rest of the world to receive salvation by the gospel because of your sacrifice for our sins, God. We, do, we don't deserve to be rescued. We don't deserve to have purpose like this. But you have chosen us to have that purpose. You have chosen us and you have rescued us. And God, I'm so humbled that I've been chosen. And I pray that everyone listening who is a disciple of Jesus Christ would feel that same gratitude. And if there's anyone listening, God, who doesn't have that same feeling or understanding or maybe hasn't made Jesus Lord yet, God, I pray that you'd inspire them to dig into your scriptures, to study the Bible, and to completely denounce the world and put all of their hope, all of their trust in you, God. Pray that you would rescue them by your death, burial, and resurrection. And I thank you for the grace that you've given us, God. As we take the bread and the cup, I thank you for the uh, bread, which symbolizes the body that was beaten and destroyed for our sake, God. And I thank you for the juice uh, that represents the blood that was spilled, the blood of the new covenant, God. And I know that only by Jesus dying and taking upon the full wrath um, that we deserved, uh, can we come close to you in communion. Thank you for this, uh, this blessing, God, of being close to you. In Jesus' name we pray.